Hello, welcome everyone. Time for a new video on building resilience in our building resilience series. Uh, today we're going to focus on the brain and I hope you enjoy it. So let's go ahead and get into our video here and just take a minute for me to pull it up. So building resilience, how can we handle stress and be more present and embodied in our lives? And just to give you a quick background in case this is the first video you're tuning into why I'm talking about this. Um, I've been a practitioner of Chinese medicine for nearly 25 years, as well as being trained in multiple other healing modalities such as somatic experiencing and biodynamic breath work and trauma release. And most of my time is spent now seeing private clients and also offering workshops, educational workshops, highly experiential workshops that are all geared towards transforming our lives to helping our bodies, our nervous systems release the trauma that's held within us so we can live healthier, more passionate lives. And today we're in our video series, we're going to focus on our brain. And don't worry if you don't have previous understanding or training in the different parts of our brain, we'll go over this, take it as slow as you like, you can digest it in pieces. It's just here so that you can get a better understanding of how the brain overall works and also get more knowledge about how your brain works because our brains work a bit different from one another. And then also to understand why we actually do have to work with our brain in order to create new habits and build resilience. Now, it's easy to think of our brain as divided into three basic areas. We have the reptilian brain, which is the oldest part of our brain, very automatic, really geared towards survival. Then we have our midbrain, also known as our limbic center, our limbic brain that's more involved with feeling and, and emotions, and then also involved very much with memory. And then we have the outer covering, the neocortex, that's very much involved with thinking, planning, learning, creating. And we'll go over each of these sections more in detail. So first that brain stem, the reptilian brain. This is the area of our brain that's very much just focused on survival, breathing, eating, quick responses to danger. A lot of just automatic functions take part there. There's not a whole lot that we do really with that part of our brain in building resilience. It's more the limbic system and the neocortex. So just understand though, there is this very old reptilian part of our brain that is involved in a fight flight response, but it's an automatic pattern. And it's there to ensure our survival. So it is able to very quickly respond to whatever is needed to threat. And that's good, we wanna have that for sure. Now the center part of our brain, this midbrain, also known as the limbic system, it has these different uh, parts to it, the, hip, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Now, don't get caught up on the names or trying to remember all this. It's really not that important. It's more, we're gonna get a sense of what the limbic system is involved with overall. Because the limbic system plays a very important part, both in trauma, trauma physiology, and also in resilience. So the limbic system is involved very much in our memory and it remembers both pleasant, happy events in our lives as well as traumatic events. It automatically perceives outside threat, a lot of sensory stimulus goes right in there through the thalamus, and then it makes choices based more on our history rather than stopping and thinking about it. It doesn't, it doesn't really analyze, that's the, the job of that neocortex. It's gonna make most of its uh, decisions based on what's happened in the past. The limbic system is involved with our controlling our feelings like anger and fear. It's also very heavily respond, responds to feelings of pain, pleasure, uh, sexual satisfaction. It's there to control aggressive or violent behaviors. If we have a properly functioning limbic system, one that isn't too hyperreactive, that doesn't um, have too much uh, dysregulation in it, so it's, it is able to control those aggressive or violent behaviors. And it responds to sensory information, especially the sense of smell. So uh, that's uh, smell is one of the things maybe you notice that a, a smell will bring back a certain memory for you. That's all part of that limbic system. Now, a big part of that we want to understand is this piece down here, this little yellow dot. We have it on both lobes. We have both the right side and the left lobe of our, of our limbic system. And it's called the amygdala. And the amygdala is really the alarm portion of our brain. It's what helps trigger that fight flight response. The amygdala also is very involved with the processing of feelings, especially fear and anger. 
Um, and it can be very hypersensitive to things like that. It can perceive fear, perhaps, where there isn't anything to be afraid of. It can perceive anger um, if it's not functioning properly. It can perceive anger on someone's face when perhaps there really isn't anything there. The amygdala can get very tuned towards seeing certain things based on what's happened in the past. <clears throat> and on the right side of the amygdala, our right amygdala stores trauma or memories of anything for which it has, we need to hold on to, to be afraid of, to help protect us more for the future. So the amygdala, the sensory and stimulus comes in from our different senses, our vision, our hearing, our smell, whatever it may be, touch, stimuli is coming in from our different senses. And in this example, to help you understand it, let's say a speeding car is coming towards you and your sense of sight is seeing the speeding car, it's able to judge, it's going quite fast. The amygdala, because you've learned about this, you've had previous experiences with speeding cars, it knows this is life-threatening. And so then it automatically triggers that bodily response of, whoa, afraid, jump back onto sidewalk. This is an example of a very successful amygdala response, and we want these sort of things. Now, some of the challenges are, though, is that the amygdala is receiving this input and it cannot always distinguish that well between past and present. Its job is to identify just whether something is dangerous to us and whether we need to pay attention to it for our survival. And if it senses any sort of threat, it instinctively sends an alarm that activates the stress hormones and sympathetic nervous system, this whole body fight or flight response. And depending on what kind of past we've had, it may determine that many, many different things out there are actually a threat. And so it can be overreactive. It can be dysregulated. It can be sending out a lot of alarm signals, activating these stress hormones, the sympathetic nervous system, when perhaps there isn't really a threat present. That's because something we call negative bias. Our amygdala is is there really to detect any negative information and it will detect negative information actually faster than positive information and that really does help us survive i mean if you think about it to the course of our evolution we had to be really aware of what was going on in our environment and be able to pick out you know dangerous animals from not so dangerous animals or dangerous plants from not so dangerous plants and really be on top of all that and so it's really easy for us to remember bad events more easily than positive ones. And so the amygdala also can be reactivated at slightest hints of danger. It doesn't do a really good job of saying, oh, there's no danger out there. That speeding car coming at me is not a problem. No, it doesn't have that. In this reactivation, though, at even the slightest hints of danger can cause a lot of uncomfortable sensations in our body, tight belly, tight throat, heart palpitations, um, intense feelings like feelings like a lot of anxiety, uh, feelings like a lot of fear, constant ongoing fear. And also it can uh, trigger impulsive or aggressive actions. You know, we might get really angry at people easily. We might be uh, very hypersensitive to things. And just to, you know, because I think it's easier to learn through pictures sometimes than just words. So here's an example of this. Let's say we had at one time, we were hurt by a, a red uh, truck. So here's a red truck. That's our original trauma. We were crossing a street one day and a red truck uh, accidentally cut us off and we got hurt somehow. Maybe we fell backwards or the truck may even have hit us for really unlucky. So there was some sort of original trauma with a red truck. And you can take this red truck and you can put anything else in there you want. It can be a person, it can be a situation, whatever it may be. So there's this original trauma. And that memory of that is held very strongly in the amygdala. And the, the amygdala then becomes very hyperactive. It can interpret other things that are similar to being just like the original trauma. So instead of this exact red truck, it can be red cars, it can be different types of red trucks, it can be different shapes of red trucks. Anything that is similar enough to that original trauma uh, can start to trigger feelings of I'm in danger. So this recreates 
the body state at the time of the original trauma, meaning that it sends a signal, okay, I'm in danger. And that then causes more release of our stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. And then we can re-experience a lot of those original fears like um, rage, sadness, those original feelings that happened at this original trauma when we see things like this. And that's, you know, we think about flashbacks. That's one of the ways that flashbacks work is that something that is similar, a sound, a sight, a, a smell, that's similar to original trauma or that can remind that amygdala of that original trauma, we then get a surge of, oh my gosh, I'm in danger. And then we have the, that cortisol and that adrenaline being released. So that's just a little bit about the limbic system. It's really important to kind of hold that piece as we move forward so you can understand more about resiliency and why we need to dampen down. We need to help uh, release and relax some of that amygdala response. And one of the ways that we do that is through our neocortex. And the neocortex is that outer part of our brain. This is the part you've probably seen many pictures like that in the past. We have the frontal lobe of the neocortex. We have the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. Um, so here's the neocortex. And we, this is the part of our brain that when we talk about, oh, I'm more right-brained, or I'm more, I'm more creative, I like to write, I'm an actress, you know, whatever, it's our emotions, more of this kind of fluid, creative side of us, we say I'm more right brain. And then the left brain we say is more logical. It's involved with science and reasoning and practical solutions to problems. So we have this idea that there's these two different parts of our brain and they do have different functions, the two different hemispheres of the cortex. As you see here, there is some truth to it. The left hemisphere is more involved with language, analysis, naming, um, facts and stats. The right side is more about spatial awareness, visual awareness, uh, different types of memories, uh, really noticing facial expression, body language. But the truth is, is that these two sides very much work together. Uh, we have another structure in the brain called the corpus callosum, which helps connect them. And, the, and these two parts are meant to work together. So the neocortex is about 30% of our entire brain. And you can see that there's these different functions in each of the different lobes. So the frontal lobe is really about planning and logic and behavioral control and personality structure. All that is part of that frontal lobe. Uh, the parietal lobe, more about making sense of the world. Temporal lobe, more about memory. It's also very close to the limbic system, which is right underneath it. So the neocortex overall is about how we understand the world how we understand how things work, how people work, and how we manage and plan out our lives. Now, the area that we're gonna really focus on for resilience is this front part, the prefrontal cortex. Maybe just take your hand right now, put it on your forehead, and take a breath. This is a lot of information. And this prefrontal cortex is our higher reasoning. It's our watchtower. You can almost think of it as our witnesses there. The watchtower, that is trying to manage and have a higher level, level overview of everything. And this prefrontal cortex is connected to our limbic system. There's fibers that go back and forth. And you can see that limbic system again, more that fight, flight, freeze response. Am I safe? What do I need to do to be safe? Um, it's where the center of our emotions. While as the prefrontal cortex, I love this, these nine main functions. And, Think about these in our life because this is really what resilience is about a lot of this. Empathy. We can feel our feelings. We can also have empathy for other people's feelings. That allows us to be attuned and connected. Insight. Awareness of our own process. Awareness of what's going on. Response flexibility. You know, something might be upsetting to us, but we have some flexibility in that response. Do we go, you know, slam our computer or send a mean email or call them up? Or do we take some time and have a few breaths and maybe go for a walk and give ourselves time to settle down before having to respond to something upsetting? That's also emotional regulation, body regulation, the ability to let our, our heart to be able to take a pause and put a hand on our chest and meet our pounding heart or our tense belly, being able to regulate some of this, what's happening in our body. Morality, 
the ability to choose how we want to respond based on our deeply held beliefs and convictions. Intuition, we all have this sense of, you know, what's right. I just have an intuitive knowing of, of where I need to be doing. Attuned communication, being able to really see another person and take on some of their experience and be able to attune our communication so that we can have more effective conversations. And then fear modulation. That's part of the prefrontal cortex's ability to dampen down that limbic system. If we have a strong development in our prefrontal cortex, when that limbic system sends up the signal of, oh my God, it's a red truck, I'm in truck, I'm in danger, I'm in danger, I'm in danger, our prefrontal cortex is able to take a pause and be able to see that incoming truck as well and say, okay, wait a minute, no, I'm here right now. This is not the trauma of back then. I'm actually okay now. So there's this fear modulation that can come in from the prefrontal cortex, knowing, okay, I'm no longer in the situation I was then. I have a different set of capacities and strengths and resources available to me now, and I don't have to respond to it with that same level of fear. So it's able to actually help stop a stress response. So the prefrontal cortex is the center of, of our executive re, uh, functioning. It's also the most recent part of our brain to develop. It's, I, I don't know how unique it is just to humans. That's something I, that'd be interesting to look at. I, I don't know really if we can even know. I mean, I, I imagine some of our closest primates uh, definitely have prefrontal cortexes, uh, but it doesn't come fully online until we're 25 years old there is actually a lot of brain development that's happening, not only in those first few years of life, but all the way through our teenage years, our brain is still undergoing changes and development and based on its use forms different pathways. So we don't really get a fully mature prefrontal cortex until our mid twenties and we can continue to grow it. This is what neuroplasticity is about. So in order to build resilience, this part of our brain really needs to be online and that's what we want to strengthen over time. So as our brain grows and develops and changes based on experience, you know, what we eat, think and do all day has a tremendous influence on our brain. I mean, I'm curious, these times right now, if you find yourself that you're spending more and more time watching the news or reading the news online, or scrolling through news stories on Facebook. Have you noticed the impact on the way you think, the speed of your thoughts, uh, what kind of sleep you're having, general levels of, of feeling you know, strong and grounded in your life or feeling more uh, fearful and shaky? These are the type of experiences I'm talking about. If we're putting in a lot of threat activity, and I, and I don't mean don't know what's going on there, and I don't mean don't pay attention to the news, but watch how much you're doing it. Because that all of those news stories do bring certain levels of stress hormones and certain levels of experiences, types of stressful experiences to our brain. And that does shape us. So we wanna use the power of neuroplasticity to build resilience, to uh, support us in regulating the function of our body and our nervous system, to strengthen our ability to be really attuned and present to someone else, especially if they're going through difficulty, to be able to be present to them and to feel our groundedness and our strength and our ability to meet and be an authentic support to somebody. It's also involved in being able to contact our felt sense to really get an overall insight into ourselves, to be aware of the sensations in our bodies and our feelings and our meaning making out of all of that. That all requires the prefrontal cortex. And then it's also involved in damping the fear signals of the amygdala, helping to keep it not going out of control, but rather to stay within a range of present moment experience and what's actually called on or what's actually needed in this moment. So I talked in a previous video about this window of tolerance, that we have these different zones. And when we're in our optimal zone, this is what we call the ventral vagal window of tolerance, we're able to feel and think. Um, we experience empathy. Feelings are tolerable. We're, we're aware of the present moment. This is all we feel open and curious. It's a big part of it versus feeling more reactive, defensive, our thoughts are racing, we start to feel overwhelmed, 
um, we notice that we're speeding up or we're getting a little hyper vigilant, we're getting edgy. Those are signs that we're nearing or just over our window of tolerance. Or the other side of it is we start to feel kind of numbed out, apathetic, we don't care anymore. Or we feel shut down, disconnected from ourselves, disconnected from others. Those are our three zones of tolerance. And the prefrontal cortex operates best, obviously, when we're in this middle zone. You know, this is the area where our prefrontal cortex is really able to bring awareness to our experience and is able to bring support to our experience versus when we go too far over here, we're more in that sympathetic activation. And when we're too far over here, we're more in that dorsal vagal shutdown and the prefrontal cortex is not able to really bring all of its tools to our experience. So with neuroplasticity, we're shaping, reshaping and shifting our brain based on new life experiences our environment and our relationships. And I emphasize new there because actually our brain is always being shaped by our experiences. That is neuroplasticity. But in building resilience, we wanna, we wanna introduce new positive experiences. And we'll be going over many different exercises in future videos that can bring in these new positive experiences into our brain. So building resilience, the key to creating that window of tolerance, because we all have a window of tolerance. And I probably said this in another video, but I'll say it now. We all have a window of tolerance. For some of us, the window is a little bit more narrow. We have a narrower range of, of what feels good to us. And it's, it's easier for us to tip over into activation or to tip out into under activation versus others of us who have more resilience on board. We have a wider window. We're able to handle more stress without going outside of our window of tolerance. We're able to handle more difficulties and challenges in our life while still feeling, you know, alert, engaged. We may not feel so calm or relaxed and, and that's okay when we're actually dealing with a stress but we are able to be engaged in dealing with it and not feeling shut down, overwhelmed, or not hyper responding, not lashing out, not overreacting. So the key, that window of tolerance where we can be fairly calm, we are definitely alert, we're fairly relaxed, and we are definitely able to engage and respond appropriately to our life. We feel centered and balanced in those situations. And so in building a resilience, because I've talked about the brain and the nervous system and, and that you've learned so far that the nervous system actually fit, feeds up into our limbic system. All that sensory information I talked about earlier coming into the amygdala, that sensory information is coming in from our nervous system. It's coming in, like I said, through our eyes, through our touch, through our hearing, all of that information is coming in from our nervous system and it's feeding all the way up to the limbic system of our brain and then also into that neocortex. And then that shapes our thoughts. Our brain takes in all these different pieces of information and based on past experiences, makes analysis of it, makes reactions out of it. And often we think that the most important thing is to change our thoughts. You know, we think, okay, if I can just change the way I'm thinking, if I could just be more positive, if I could just, you know, stop worrying, things would be so much better. And while there can be some benefit to, there's definitely some benefit to working with our thoughts, I think of it as that's actually starting kind of at the end of the line, you know, the end of the train. You're not really starting with the engine, you know, with a train where the engine is actually driving where the train is going and not the last car on the train. It's trying to just work with your thoughts is just kind of trying to control where this last car is going. You have to work with the engine. And so that engine is the body. The engine is what is actually coming up through all that sensory information, through our internal sensations in our body. You know, it's not just sight and sound and, and a sense of touch that's feeding up to the limbic system, but it's also a tension in our body. It's looking at, you know, the, the butterflies that are happening in our stomach or the pounding heart, all that feeds up and then we start to make meaning out of it. So we want to understand how the chain of events happen so we can see how working with our body to actually strengthen that flow between the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system that restores the flow and helps us build resilience. 
So working with our body is really working with the engine, with the first car, that train that helps direct how things are going to go from there. So I hope you enjoy today's video. Next video is we're going to talk about the kidney and adrenal system and more about our stress response. And I'm going to create some more videos on what are some home exercises? What are some practices you can do to strengthen your resilience? And they will be both based in the body and breath and working with imagery um, and also working with your thoughts, things that you can do to help support your nervous system and create more resiliency. So thank you for watching. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe. And you can also visit my website to see any upcoming retreats and trainings I'll be offering. So thank you very much. And I wish you a beautiful day. Stay well, stay healthy, um, stay safe. And I'll see you again soon. If you have any questions, please just post them down below. And I'll be sure to answer them in the next videos. Thank you so much. Bye for now.